Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. In this session, we are continuing our previous critique of the book, Discovering Dispensationalism, uh, edited by Corey Marsh and James Fazio. Again, just to be very clear, as we said last week, this is not a critique of the entire book. The book itself, overall, with several different contributors, is actually a very good book. It's a very important contribution to the ongoing discussion of dispensationalism, kind of this ongoing conflict within the body of Christ between the Reformed, those who embrace a Reformed theology, and a dispensational theology. It's overall a really good book. What we are focusing on is criticizing chapter 5, which was written uh, by contributor William C. Watson. Watson is uh, the author of the book that we've previously criticized, um, critiqued, criticized, either way, Dispensationalism Before Darby. So whether it's this book or chapter 5 in Discovering Dispensationalism, what Watson is trying to do is show and demonstrate that various dispensational ideas and doctrines have widely been taught and held and believed throughout church history. Now, to be very clear, I agree with that premise. Many of the foundational doctrines of dispensationalism, they've been held from the very beginning. Again, I'm a historic premillennialist. I believe in premillennialism, and it's historic because it was the view that was held by the majority of the early Christian church, right? So I would agree with the general premise that there are elements or ideas, dispensational doctrines and ideas, that were commonly held um, long before John Nelson Darby. However, what I aggressively disagree with, and I will defend this publicly with anyone, anywhere, is the notion that the pre-tribulational rapture was ever taught in church history. It simply wasn't. The absolute best that we can find is possible hints or possible suggestions. Like, You know, like if you get somebody that's really pre-trib, they go, this is pre-trib. But if you lay it out in front of the sort of public, the vast majority are going to go, no, that's that's not pre-trib. I mean, unless they are dyed in the wool and just defending their team, those who are honest for the most part, academic consensus up until just recently held that all of the early church fathers were post-trib or post-trib pre-wrath is fine. Okay, so in last week's session we looked at two individuals that Watson claims were pre-tribbers. We actually looked at three. We touched on the pseudo-Ephraim, or Ephraim the Syrian. Um, We've addressed that in a previous session. We looked at his claim concerning Caesarius of Arles, as well as another guy named Aspringius of Beja. I think it's Beja or Beja, I'm not really sure. In this week's session, we're going to look at two more individuals. We're going to look at an early church writer uh, known as Ocumenius, And then we're going to look at another guy named or referred to as the Venerable Bede. Okay, very well-known theologian. Um, He did write quite a bit about um, the end times and this sort of thing, but a a sort of very highly respected uh, early church writer for the UK. Okay, because he sort of outlined the whole history of Christianity going to uh, the British Islands and this sort of thing. But both of these individuals, Watson claims taught a pre-tribulational rapture. So here's the statement from Watson as he makes this claim concerning Ocumenius. He says, Ocumenius believed that many will already be in heaven while the future tribulation period is continued on the earth. So he says, during the tribulation period, Ocumenius believed that many saints would already be in heaven. And then he goes on, he says, concerning the great multitude before God's throne in Revelation 7, Ocumenius' dispensational eschatology is perhaps clearest with its pre-tribulational inferences. So again, Watson says that Ocumenius best demonstrated early dispensationalism, that's what he's saying, basically early Darbyism, if you will. He says it's most pronounced with its its clearest with its pre-tribulational inferences. So he says Ocumenius taught a pre-tribulational rapture. He believed that the saints would be in heaven at least during part of the tribulation. Now, to be fair, if that's the case, it sounds to me more like pre-wrath. But unfortunately, um, again, because some of these pre-trib 
teachers and scholars, they're sort of clawing, they're grasping at straws, so to speak. They'll even claim pre-Rathers and say, see, this guy's pre-trib. But technically, that's really not fair. It's not fair to say that someone is pre-trib when they're actually pre-Rath. But here's the reality. Ocumenius is not even pre-Rath. He's post-trib. He teaches clearly a post-tribulational rapture. Now, I'm going to say this. In all of the various quotations that we've looked at, um, there's really only two that, I'm sorry, there's actually three in all of church history that I get it. I get it when a pre-tribber looks at the statement and goes, I think that's pre-trib. I get it when a pre-tribber sees the uh, statement by pseudo-Ephraim and they go, I think that's pre-trib. And then later I explain and I go, no, actually, if you read the full context of the various, there's actually various sermons in which that particular quote appears, then you can see that what pseudo-Ephraim or Ephraim was referring to was actually those who died before the tribulation, and thus they are taken to heaven, they're gathered to heaven in death, of course, just their souls, and they're able to avoid seeing the tribulation. That's all he was saying, okay? But I get it when someone just sees the quote out of context, they're eager to validate their particular view, I get it, okay? This is the second quote, which upon initially reading it, you go, oh, wait a minute, is this pre-trib? Like, did they actually find one? But then when you actually stop for a second and slowly reread it and then go, oh, here's another explanation, then you go, oh, it's, he's obviously not pre-trib. But I'm going to go ahead and read the quote, and this is where Watson believes that he found a very clear, again, clear pre-tribulational uh, statement in the writings of Ocumenius. So commenting on Revelation chapter 7, he says this. He says, the previous discourse, this is, he's referring to his own previous sermon, explained what was revealed to the holy evangelist, he's talking about John the Apostle, concerning those from the nation of Israel. Now he's talking about the 144,000. We hope you're enjoying this Maranatha Global Bible Study. wanted to take a quick minute here and ask you to consider something. Our highest priority as an organization is laying foundations where there are none in the 1040 window in accordance with Romans 15, to name the name where it's never been named. Now, if this is something that resonates with you, if you love the Maranatha message, proclaiming it to the ends of the earth at the end of the age, if this is something that resonates with you, I want to ask you to consider becoming a $5 monthly supporter of FAI. This is as crazy as it sounds, one of the most relevant and significant ways that you can support the work of the Great Commission through the FAI Global Family is by giving $5 a month. Because as the collective body of $5 givers a month grows, so too does our ability to increase our workforce on the ground and expand our initiatives and activities and operations in the Middle East in the 1040 window. So click on the link below for more information and consider starting today becoming a $5 monthly supporter of FAI. Thank you guys. Back to the teaching. Now what's interesting here, by the way, let me just say this, is so far by referring to the 144,000, Ocumenius actually agrees with what Dalton and I have taught in our Revelation uh, study, the, the Maranatha Global Bible study in the book of Revelation. He agrees with what the majority of dispensationalists today believe, that the 144,000 who are from the various 12 tribes of Israel, they actually are literally from the nation of Israel. Okay, so very dispensationalist thinking. Okay, so that's good. And then he says, these were those who were sealed and therefore they were saved and who afterwards also had come to faith. So basically he's saying they were sealed during the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, they were sealed, or just before the tribulation, and then they actually get saved afterwards. And then here's the part that's relevant, the part that's um, boldened and underlined. He says, but, lest something be lacking in what was revealed to him, in what was revealed to John the Apostle, the vision also shows him the countless thousands of Gentiles. He's talking about the great multitude who later embrace the faith and being with the Lord stand before the throne of God. So here is a great multitude standing before the throne of God in heaven. And then he says, however, since the prophetic vision has not yet depicted the second coming of the Lord, when the saints are caught up to meet the, in the clouds to meet the Savior, as the Holy Apostle says, he's referring to Paul the Apostle, he says the vision shows them as caught up beforehand, and having already obtained the blessedness that awaits them. You go, wait a minute, 
It says they're caught up beforehand. Here's the great multitude of saints. They're in heaven, and it says right here they're caught up beforehand. I go, hold on, slow down, back up, reread what was just read. Without someone telling you you're about to read a pre-tribulational statement, reread it with this as the explanation, because this is, what, this is actually what Ocumenius is saying. All he is saying is this. He is saying, because the book of Revelation, because the prophetic vision hasn't gotten to the part yet, when it describes the second coming, when the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds, because it hasn't gotten to that part yet, it jumps ahead, and before it gets to that part, beforehand it shows, the Lord showed John the Apostle, the saints in heaven, it sort of jumped forward, it skipped forward. So, okay, now I know that sounds weird. Go, let's go back and let's just reread the relevant portion. Okay, he says this, he says, Since the prophetic vision has not yet depicted the second coming of the Lord when the saints are caught up to meet the Savior. When does Ocumenius say the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds? At the second coming. Not a pre-tribulational phantom rapture seven years or three and a half years or any number of years before the second coming. Rather, Ocumenius says the saints will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air when? At the second coming. He says, but because the prophetic vision had not yet depicted the second coming of the Lord, when the saints will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Savior, as Paul the Apostle says, the Holy Apostle says, he says, the vision shows them as caught up beforehand. The vision shows them as caught up beforehand, as having already obtained the blessedness that awaits them. That's all he's saying. He goes, like, the Lord showed him ahead of time. They hadn't gotten to that part yet, but the Lord revealed it beforehand. That's it. Now, many of you, again, died in the world pre-tribbers. You're going to be going... No, 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 it's clearly talking to pre-trib. Well, again, if that's the case, then Ocumenius contradicts himself clearly. He's not schizophrenic. I would argue he's not schizophrenic. Rather, he knows what he believes. As he states right here, the gathering together of the saints in the clouds happens when the Savior returns at the second coming. But let's look at a couple of his other statements just to validate the fact that he is absolutely a post-tribber. Here's another statement from his commentary on Revelation chapter 7. He says, One of the elders asked the evangelists who those were who were from the nations who were clothed in white robes. So he's going, who are these clothed in white robes? Who is this great multitude? He asked this not because he didn't know, but rather to urge the evangelist to know about them more fully. So the angel asked a leading question because he wants John the Apostle to understand it. And here's the important part. He says, and so he says, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. For the righteous endured not a small struggle, but indeed an exceedingly great struggle during the rule of the Antichrist. So at the very, very least, based on this statement alone, if we're just looking at this quote, you would say, well, they were removed. They went through a horrible tribulation under the Antichrist. They endured this, it was not a small struggle, rather, it was an exceedingly great struggle during the rule, the reign of the Antichrist. At the very least, you have to say Ocumenius was pre-wrath. But, again, based on his previous statement that the catching up in the clouds of the saints to meet the Lord in the air happens at the second coming, that makes him a post-tribber. Again, you have to take the totality of what Ocumenius taught. Here's another statement. This is from Revelation chapter 8. And what is the loosing of the seventh seal? So here we are at the seventh seal. Again, every pre-tribber will say the rapture happens before the first seal. Here we are at the seventh seal. It is the second coming of the Lord and the giving of the blessings as rewards. Ocumenius places the second coming of the Lord at the seventh trumpet. He was not pre-trib. He was closer to a pre-rather. For although some are handed over, actually, the difference, however, let me just qualify this. Pre-rathers today, I mean, those who follow after, you know, the, the main pre-rath teachers, like Alan Kirshner, a good friend of mine, who I esteem highly, they are very clear that the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls 
are consecutive, okay? So the trumpets follow after the seals. The bowls follow after the trumpets. Ocumenia sees all seven of the trumpets as encompassed within the seventh seal. So in fairness, Ocumenius was some combination of modern-day pre-wrath teaching with modern-day post-trib teaching. In fact, just as a little hint, Ocumenius is probably the, in terms of just describing the seals and the trumpets, he's probably the closest to what I am, which is a hybrid between pre-wrath and post-trib. That's for another session that we're going to get to. Let's continue. He says, so here we are at the seventh seal. He says, it is the second coming of the Lord, the giving of the blessings as rewards. For although some are handed over to the punishment of sinners, nonetheless, it is the aim of Christ and the intention of the incarnation that everyone become an heir of his kingdom. He goes, so there's some people that are going to basically be judged like sinners, but it's always been the Lord's will and his desire that everyone come to faith that everyone becomes an heir of the kingdom. Therefore, when the seventh seal was loose, there was, it says, silence for about half an hour. Since the king of creation was coming in every angelic and supernatural power, astounded at the exceeding greatness of the glory of him who was coming, for that reason they became silent. Because of the shining, radiating glory of Jesus, all of heaven is silent. Then it says, here we are, the seven trumpets were given to the seven angels so that they might sound the signal that the king was arriving. So notice the seventh trumpets signal, they signal beforehand the coming of the king, uh, that he was arriving. But by these very trumpets, the angels will also awaken those who are dead. So it's by the blasting of the trumpets that the dead in Christ will awaken. For the apostle, who is wise in divine things, wrote in his first letter to the Thessalonians, here we are, He's referring again to Paul the Apostle. The Lord himself will descend at a command, at the call of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet of God. And again, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. So Ocumenius believed that the resurrection and the rapture happens when? At the last of the seven trumpets, which he believes are encompassed within the seventh seal. There is no way, shape, or form that anyone can say with a straight face that Ocumenius taught a pre-tribulational rapture. Watson did not do his due diligence. He did not carefully read through all of Ocumenius. Rather, he did what he always does, which is he cherry-picks. He finds a statement that he thinks is pre-trib. In this case, he's clearly, again, once again, clearly misunderstood what the author was saying, and then he champions it, celebrates it, while ignoring all of these other very relevant statements. Here's another quote from Ocumenius from his commentary in Revelation chapter 17. He says these, he's referring to the ten kings, the ten kings who will uh, rule under the authority of the Antichrist. He says they will make war on the Lamb, it says, for before... They are wholly destroyed by the Antichrist. These kings, about whom the passage is speaking, will persecute the church. Okay, so here's the ten kings persecuting not just the saints, not the righteous, not those who get saved later, the church. And Christ will triumph in another way also, since his servants struggle to death for their faith in him. What is it in this particular session? Why are we taking all of this time? to work through example after example, showing that there is no pre-tribulational ever taught in the writings of the early church because we want the end times church, we want today's church to identify with the church throughout history that has been waiting and preparing to, if necessary, lay down their lives to die for Jesus. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt the teaching, If you don't already know it, let me tell you once again that the basis of our existence is Romans 15, 20, where Paul makes it clear that his driving force for mission in the world was to lay foundations for the gospel where there were none and to preach the gospel to those who'd never heard the name of Jesus. And if you would like to join us in that effort or find out more information about how you can connect with us in our pioneering initiatives in the 1040 window amongst people where there are no foundations, you can go to faistudios.org to find more information. Back to the teaching. 
Now, again, we reject all kinds of other different doctrines throughout church history. Church history is a it's a uh, cornucopia, it's a potpourri grab bag of all sorts of different doctrines, okay? I want to be clear. But where the early church had it right was this belief, this expectation that at any time it could come rapidly. The last days could become upon us. They could be upon us. And we need to be ready to lay down our lives if necessary. And he says that the saints here, the servants of Jesus, they will struggle to death for their faith in him. This is exactly what we're trying to convey here. So in conclusion, with regard to Ocumenius, again, I'm just going to contrast side by side Watson's statement. He says, Ocumenius' dispensational eschatology is perhaps clearest with its pre-tribulational inferences. In other words, his statements that are pre-trib, that he taught a pre-trib rapture. Here's Ocumenius. The ten kings, again under the Antichrist, will make war on the Lamb, but before they are wholly destroyed by the Antichrist, these kings about whom the passage is speaking will persecute the church. The church will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord at the second coming, at the blasting of the seventh trumpet. Okay, Watson is simply out in left field on this one, just like he has been consistently so far with every single one of the claims that he's made. Every single one. Not a single one has even been close to supporting a pre-tribulational rapture. Now we're going to look at the Venerable Bede. Here is Watson's quote. Here is his claim regarding Bede. He says, From his exposition of Revelation 3, verse 10, the Venerable Bede believed the church would escape the hour of temptation. So unqualified statement, Watson says, Bede believed the church would escape the temptation, the hour of temptation, the great tribulation. He says, but the unsaved Jews would remain on the earth to endure the Antichrist. Those poor Jews, right? The Jews suffer, but we get out of here. As can be seen, Bede's eschatology reflects what is taught today in dispensational premillennialism. So he goes, Bede agrees with us. Let us now test these things to see whether or not they're true. Here is Bede's comments on Revelation 3.10. He says, so first he quotes the book of Revelation. He says, because you have kept the word of my patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming. Because you have kept my example in enduring adversaries, I will also preserve you from the impending sufferings. Again, he says preserve. This Now, here we go. This does not mean that you will not be tempted, but that you will not be overcome by your adversaries. So he goes, it doesn't, I'm not saying that you're not going to face the temptations and the trials. I'm simply saying that you won't be overcome. That's what Bede says. Bede says, the, the passage is not saying that you will not see the temptations. You won't experience the temptations. You simply won't succumb to them. You will not be overcome. He says, it is possible in this passage that the hour of temptation and the humiliation of the Jews at the time of the Antichrist are indicated. So he goes, it's possible, it's possible that Revelation 3 verse 10 is talking about the last days. He says, for just as it is often the case in the sixth place, in the order of that which follows, so also here in the sixth angel. So Bede has some sort of theories with regard to numbers. Don't get confused or lost here. He's just talking about the importance of the number six and the sixth angel and this type of thing. He says, so also here in the sixth angel, the final persecution may be signified. Okay, so he's talking about the sixth angel. He says the final persecution, so the great tribulation. During this persecution, certainly those of the Jews who are wicked will deceive as well as be deceived. Yet others will come to understand the law spiritually through the teaching of the great prophet Elijah. And being incorporated with the members of the church. So he goes, there's going to be some people during the tribulation among the Jews that will come to faith by the preaching of Elijah and they'll become members of the church. They will believe and courageously conquer the enemy. The letter to the angel of Philadelphia is the sixth out of the seventh letters. So because it's the sixth letter, Bede understands that this correlates to the uh, sixth angel. I don't know if that's... If he correlates that to the sixth trumpet or the sixth seal or this type of thing. But he says, because it's the sixth angel, it's talking about the great tribulation. Now, let's go ahead and 
note some of the other beads very very clear comments to see that what he's saying here is anything but a pre-tribulational rapture he says by the op opening of the sixth seal so here we are at the sixth seal the last persecution is announced kind of kind of makes it clear doesn't it here we are at the sixth seal the great tribulation is announced and that the world is shaken with darkness and fears when the Lord was crucified on the sixth day of the week. This is when the servants of Antichrist are brought to attack the servants of Christ. The church, more than is wont, will shed her blood for Christ. What did Bede teach? He taught that in the last great persecution, you and me, will shed our blood for Christ on the earth throughout the world. That's what Bede clearly taught. And he said the whole, because the last earthquake will be in the whole world. But before that, as it is written, there will be earthquakes in various places. Here's another quote. He says, it is believed that after the death, after the death of the Antichrist, and who kills the Antichrist but Jesus, there will be a short rest for the church which Daniel thus foretold, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days. When does the church receive rest? After the full three and a half years. B did not believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, guys. He believes the church would receive rest after the Antichrist is killed at the end of the three and a half years. Here's another quote. He says, observe that at the sixth seal, again, we're at the sixth seal, he, that's John the Apostle, sees the greatest afflictions of the church. And then here we are again, just like Ocumenius before him. He says, the sixth trumpet, okay, so we already saw that at the sixth seal, the persecution was announced, and here we are at the sixth trumpet, the open war of the Antichrist and his followers against the church. This is really fascinating stuff, guys. Bede placed the rapture at the end of the tribulation at the blasting of the seventh trumpet, which he sees as being encompassed, just like Ocumenius, within the sixth and seventh seals. And so in conclusion, again, once more, we're just going to contrast and compare uh, Watson's quote with the statement from the Venerable Bede. He says, The sixth trumpet is the open war of the Antichrist and his hordes, his followers, against the church. Bede was a post-tribber. Watson says, The Venerable Bede believed the church would escape the hour of temptation, but the unsaved Jews would remain on the earth to endure the Antichrist. That's nonsense. That's wishful thinking. That is absolutely confirmation bias. Either one, it's confirmation bias, where just his own brain tricked him, and he obviously didn't read the rest of Bede's work. He obviously just cut right to Revelation 3.10 to see, oh, what's he say about this? And then he goes, oh, look, he's pre-trib. And then you go, no, actually, read what he said. He's not pre-trib. Or take the time to read some of his other statements in which he clearly expresses that he was not pre-trib. Guys, I, again... I don't want to beat up on William C. Watson. I don't want to beat up on any individual. This is not personal. But guys, this gets to the point, like, this is so bad. This is not just sloppy scholarship. Example after example after example, every single one, Watson claims uncategorically that they were pre-trib, and none of them are. This is theological fraud. Like, again, as I said, I'm impressed with this book overall. I just wish they hadn't included William C. Watson, and I wish that the editors, quite frankly, had done the little bit of work that I did here. Just jump on Logos, look at some of the primary sources, do a little bit of reading. It didn't take me long at all to show that this was not peer-reviewed. Uh, at least Watson's chapter was not peer-reviewed. This is not just sloppy. This is really, really bad. Again, just to wrap this up, guys, why are we taking all of the time to do this? Because there is deception in the church. There are deceivers. There are people who are so bound and determined to prove their point, to defend their team, that they will actually lie and manufacture. We've seen it. We've seen selective editing of quotes. We've seen outright deception. 
And at the very least, we've seen really horrible scholarship. Why does any of this matter? Once again, we don't base our view of the rapture based on what the church says. We base it on the scriptures. But as we try to study the scriptures and understand what the scriptures say, it's important that we also pay attention to what the Lord has been saying to his church down through history and throughout history up until just less than 200 years ago, really like 150 years ago. The entire church was preparing to face the great trial. It's not until modern times, mostly in the United States, and then we send it out all over the world, has this lie been taught that we don't have to face the test. We don't have to take the test. We're going to be removed before the great trial, even though that has never been the pattern in the church throughout all of history. It has never been the pattern. Rather, we are called to imitate Jesus, to take up our cross every single day, to follow, to imitate his pattern, and to bear witness to the world, and as Bede said, if necessary, shed our blood for Jesus. God, give us strength. Give us strength in that day that we wouldn't cower, we wouldn't shrink back, we wouldn't cry, we wouldn't quake in fear, but rather we would joyfully resign ourselves to eternal life and the rewards that come with martyrdom. Amen? All right, guys, um, one more session. We'll f wrap up our criticism. We're going to look next week at Andrew of Caesarea. And we'll finish our critique of this book, uh, and then we'll continue uh, with the study. So God bless you all. Have a good week. Stand firm. Be strong. Have fun. And Maranatha. Maranatha.